Welcome to the Neural Implant Podcast, where we talk with the people behind the current events and breakthroughs in brain implants in an understandable way, helping bring together various fields involved in neuroprosthetics. Here is your host, Ladin Yurichek. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Neural Implant Podcast. Today's guest is Ben Paul, and he is actually the CEO and founder of Neuroloom, and they actually build living electrodes. So uh, it's a company and you know he, he founded it and you can almost call it 3D print a scaffold onto which they put living neurons and then they implant that into the body. And then the body's neurons are able to interface with that instead of interfacing with the actual device. And so this has the benefit of not needing to have so many requirements in terms of you know flexibility and biocompatibility and because essentially the neurons in the body are interfacing with with the neurons of the device. So I think this is very cool, very futuristic stuff. And he's starting this out. He's very lean. He started this out maybe two or three years ago in 2017. And he's won some you know, grants here and there or startup funds, incubator funds, and kind of trying to build this out a little bit outside of academia, but still using academia to do some experiments and really nail the science before moving on to the business plan. So very interesting stuff. I hope you enjoy it. Ben Paul, pleasure to have you on the show. You are the CEO and founder of Neuraloom, and basically you have biohybrid electrodes, uh, implantable electrodes, which have kind of a scaffold, which you almost 3D print, it seems like, and then on that you put living neurons to then be implanted into the body, and that better interfaces with the body, and, and you're able to get more information through without any degradation. Thanks for coming on. Do you want to introduce yourself a little bit better than I just did? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Thanks for that introduction. It's, it's really great on the podcast. Your, your description there of, of my work was pretty good, but I'll give a little introduction to my own background as well. So I originally studied neuroscience and I, I specialized in uh, developmental neurobiology, which is the development of the nervous system from the embryo. And then I moved into bioengineering as I saw that it was really advanced imaging and electrophysiology in innovations that were pushing forward the field of, of neuroscience. And, and these two sort of themes of the, the creation of nervous systems and the advanced ways to interface with it then sort of merged in my PhD when I started using very high resolution 3D printing technologies to pattern the growth of neurons in in combination with electronics to build biohybrid devices. After that, I then started a company to build biohybrid devices for implanting in the body. And uh, as Ladan mentioned, uh, for a range of therapeutic purposes, including restoring vision, but as well as restoring a wide range of other neural functions and also restoring certain neurological functions that lost through not say necessarily uh, sensory loss like uh, with vision, but the degradation of neural processing in cortical circuitry that is responsible for many neuropsychiatric and neurodegenerative disorders. Okay. Do you want to talk a little bit about the technology? Because actually something that really caught my eye is that you're using photon scale polymeric 3D printing techniques. Does this mean two photon polymerization? Yeah, it does indeed. Yes. Yeah. So. Oh my God. Yes, yeah, so mm -hmm. exactly. So it's very high resolution and two photon polymerized gives us wonderful 3D design freedom. You can really build it so any almost any structure. Some overhangs are quite difficult, but compared to many 3D printing technologies, it's quite superior. And the resolution, you know, the smallest feature size I think someone has made with two photon polymerization is 50 nanometers. But generally, we, we're working in more of the sort of 500 nanometers to a few microns. But this sort of highlights a useful scale for biology, for biofabrication in general, but particularly for neurons is this meso scale, which is between one micron and one centimeter. So you have feature sizes that are about the size of subcellular neural processes like axons and dendrites, but can actually go up to the size of a whole neural tissue like a, a nerve ganglion or a, a layer of cortical tissue. So there's an application for two photon polymerization in producing artificial neural tissues directly to, to mimic the structure of the nervous system. But before we get to that complexity, we build very simple 
neural structures that are really sort of based on designs of uh, penetrating microelectrode arrays. But here we're decoupling the neural interface. So we're decoupling the penetrative element and the conducting element, which in an, a penetrative electrode array like a Utah array is, is all involved in one sort of element. You have to have a, a material which is both stiff and conducting electrode and flexible and selective and stimulating different types of neurons. And our answer there is, well, if you use neurons to do the stimulating bit, then the material you make at your penetrating element, your sort of yeah, microneedle type structure, has a lot more flexibility. It doesn't have to be conductive. In fact, it can be temporary. You can make that biodegradable or make it bioactive so that it causes much less immune response. And the immune response that is caused, although it encapsulates the microneedles themselves, because the conducting the neuron is decoupled from that structure and, and doesn't require the same ability to emanate charge as an electrode would, then you know the interface is less disturbed by any immune response, even in the case that it does occur. Beyond that, there's some very interesting advantages that come with this in in, in taking this the use of the biological element further. So by varying the subtype of neuron that you culture within these devices, you can influence the subtype of neuron which you synapse with in the host tissue, which is something that's been been sort of demonstrated and established in a variety of sort of regenerative medicine investigations, implanting different subtypes of neurons as a, a strategy for, say, stroke repair or restoring vision even. And, and that kind of highlights a key thesis behind what we're doing, which is taking tissue engineering techniques, and um, particularly for neural tissues, and, and applying those to bioelectronics to create these biological adapters or living electrodes. Yeah, that's pretty amazing stuff. I mean, especially I, I was always looking at, you know, the two photon polymerization. I'm just like, man, I don't know how to use this and I'm trying to figure it out. But like, uh, I think this would be great for neural implants. So it sounds like you're able to do that. And then, as you said, kind of changing the subtype of the neurons, being able to connect to different ones. That really reminds me of a, you know, CCD device inside of a camera. And a lot of these photo sensors have colored filters in front of them. So they see the red light or green light. And then from that, they're able to put together a color image. Is that something similar? I mean, are you able to put different subtypes next to each other? Or would, for example, the whole device have to be one subtype? No, no, exactly. And that's something that we're working on at the moment is creating multiple different cell types within the same device. That I think that's really nicely portrayed in a couple of the applications. So one really fairly straightforward one is in a complete spinal cord injury right where you you're trying to transmit information across this lesion that has occurred across a big bundle of information carrying cables the fascicles of axons sending information in both directions and if you try to take that information out just with electrodes it can be quite difficult to assign what signals are coming from what type of electrodes now the device for uh, a biohybrid device for bridging the spinal cord essentially you would insert a, a sort of cross section of the spinal cord into where the lesion was you remove the lesion and so it's a bit like a a tissue engineering strategy you're putting something in there that looks like it's really physically bridging the gap between the the two severed parts of the spinal cord but within that is this preformed culture of neurons with their somas sitting around the sort of inner edge of that device on electrode arrays and their cables being guided and bundled into the same structure as the spot as the spinal cord on either side of it and that allows for the sig the the axons within the spinal cord which are very dense to kind of be splayed out to the density that microelectrode arrays can then record from and here by varying the subtype of neuron whether it's a, a sensory neuron or motor neuron or interneuron that we culture within that device we we get a specific targeting from the the reciprocal neuron within the spinal cord so we can already start what we could just call annotating the information we know that this this particular channel that we're recording is is being recorded from a sensory neuron and roughly where in the spinal cord too 
And that makes the latter sort of signal processing as you're trying to take out this big amount of dense information a little bit easier because you don't have to have all of the amplification circuitry to both record and stimulate, which cells you're going to record and stimulate from when you build the device. And so this, those neurons, they don't have a biocompatibility issue with the device. They're cool with it, I guess. They don't have any, any kind of rejection or anything like this. Why do they, why do they not have it and the, the body would? So one of the issues with, you know, the, the, the main type of electrodes that are particularly, particularly rejected from the body are these penetrative electrodes, which allow you to stimulate deeper within the tissue and also provide you with more specificity. Now, the the big issue there where they're rejected is this big mechanical mismatch between the structure that you're embedding and the host tissue. So it, it's sort of acting like a bit like a whisk in chocolate pudding. I've heard a neurosurgeon describe it before. And that causes a lot of damage to the, the host tissue and a lot of immune response. In this case, we're just using planar electrode arrays. And the neurons that we're culturing are just sitting gently on top of them. We form that interface outside of the body before we're implanting. And there's a number of ways that we can coat the coatings we've developed, and many others have, have developed for a while, to, to make the, the substrate very amenable to the growth of neurons. So they can survive very well on, on these planar microelectrode arrays. And then when we implant them into the body, it's important that we design the device to ensure that there's sufficient access of those somas to to nutrient and and oxygen supply from the host tissue, which again is where we we look into the strategies that tissue engineering has developed to answer some of those problems. Okay, and I mean obviously you know implanting living biological you know, specimens into the body might be you know, a huge cause for concern with with rejection and everything like this. I mean, it's, it's almost like a virus or the body sees it as, you know, a foreign a parasite or something like that. Is there any issues with that? Or is there any rejection from the body from the actual cells? So in that case, we, you know, our, our primary strategy with that is to use induced pluripotent stem cells. So taking tissue from the, the patient and differentiating that into stem cells and then inducing those into stem cells and then differentiating them into different subtypes of neurons. And so as the cells within the device are made from the patient's own tissue, they actually then provide antigens that, that make the, the body think this device is part of its body. So the body thinks you're reattaching an arm or something like that. Exactly. When it when it sees the, the neuron you've implanted, it, it sees a, a neuron of its own body. It recognizes it as itself. And then regulatory wise, like, is this, this sounds like it could be a huge, huge hurdle, you know, implanting living biology into your body. Is this something that you've uh, kind of come up against is getting approval for doing this kind of thing? Is the hurdle bigger than, for example, implanting, I don't know, a glass electrode? Yeah, it is. It involves a, a whole nother arm of, of medical device regulations. So it's counted both as a, an active implantable electronic device, as say, uh, a glass electrode or, or the sort of existing spinal cord and deep brain stimulators. But it then has this sort of separate category of also being an advanced medicinal therapy product, which is what cell and gene therapies and re regenerative medi medicine therapies fall under. Now, because it comes under both of those regulatory uh, schemes, you actually have to do a, a combined therapy regulatory scheme and will will probably be fairly fairly novel but it will be the in integration of those sort of two existing existing schemes uh, particularly for the aspects involving the the sort of the relevant procedures which does make it it's a daunting task but it is possible because both of those both elements have been done before we're just bringing these existing pathways together and interestingly it's something that regulators can sometimes be interested in being quite supportive for because I won't be the the last person proposing the sort of bio, biologi, biologization 
which which I understand is a real word, of devices and of implantable electronic devices. Yeah, definitely. I mean, this actually really reminds me of University of Pittsburgh paper I, I read you know, a few years ago by uh, Dr. Casey Cullen. And they, they did something, they implanted basically these kind of living electrodes into the brain. And it, they found that it worked wonderfully. And it really reminded me, I remember we did a Journal Club article about this. It really reminded me of like in the movie Avatar, where they put their hair together and, you know, it kind of connects and they can like read each other's minds and everything like this. It kind of like the neurons just kind of intertwine and they, they connect and then boom, a great connection, almost like a nerve fiber or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And first of all, with uh, with Casey Cullen, he's, he's, you know, after I sort of, when I first came up with this idea, having come from a, a sort of different, different approach with this sort of 3D printing background, I, I came up with the idea independently, but then quickly came across Casey Cullen's work. And, and to my knowledge, I, I kind of see him as a, as a seminal figure in the field. There's not many publications before him that that are really getting to the point and and to date his his approaches are, are probably the most advanced although they don't include the advanced microfabrication techniques which which we're incorporating in terms of analogy with avatar it's something that i noticed as well very much and it's almost like we're, we're trying to build one of those tails on on an exist on existing electronic technology that we already have and, and neuralume's main purpose is building those tails and integrating them into electronic. We're not going directly for the tail. We think that might be a bit ambitious to start with. And then Unobtainium, that's a completely different company. Yeah, but it does. I mean, there is an element here where you kind of open up, you know, we're, we're creating these artificial neural tissues to connect to electronic devices, because right now, that's where we see the sort of the simplest tissue, neural tissue with the greatest, you know, commercial and societal value. But beyond that, you know, the ability to control the, the architecture of neural structures, which, which you know, are, are the, the same processing equipment that are allowing us to have this conversation and, and all of the thoughts and creativity we've ever had, you know, getting control of that medium so that we can build with it, not, not just to make simple adapters, but to make extensions and, and who knows what else is, is, a, is a field that, that yeah, May may sound a bit like unobtainium, but is is really the natural progression in the field of artificial neural tissue engineering. Yeah, I think it's pretty exciting. I, I want to talk about Neuralume itself. You know, the company it looks like you started in 2017, and then you won an accelerator award for 100,000 pounds. That was a few years ago. How, what have you been up to since then? And, and and why did you end up starting a company versus developing this more in a lab? What was kind of the reasoning behind this? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean that's a it's a good question because the level of the technology is it's, there's still a lot of development to do. So it could be argued for a position in an you know, academic setting. So that's are both very good questions. Since I won the the prize you mentioned, I've won a couple of other prizes that have allowed us to to continue producing different designs of these micro micro needles and other neural guidance structures, culturing neurons and stem cells derived neurons within them and integrating them with basic electrode arrays. So we now have a kind of prototype, as it were, we've integrated the sort of three core technologies, electrode arrays, living neurons and 3D printed structures designed for implantation. Just before the lockdown, we we were about to implant those into rodent cortexes for the first time in the sort of lead up to do some calcium imaging and optogenetics to, to demonstrate that we could do this selective stimulation. That's on hold at the moment. But in the meantime, as well, we've been really from going from this in this core invention of microstructured living electrodes or microstructured biohybrid neural interfaces to real designs of products for specific neurological disorders takes quite a lot of work and, and working out then which of those products should be developed first and which can be developed in parallel to inform the sort of development pipeline has been a large part of what we've been looking at. So so landscaping in, in some sense, but also designing down to the actual CAD designing of different microstructures, but, you know, the clinical implementation of the different products that could come out of of this technology which vary wildly you know from the clinical demonstration the clinical trials of each one and all of these all of this information and analysis 
we've been using to essentially influence the investment development pipeline that we're putting forward uh, as we start pitching uh, later this summer. So that's what we've been up to there a bit. As to your original question there, you know, why in the private sector, not in the public sector? For starts, I, I never had the idea in the academic setting. And I think this is really quite key because in the academic setting, I was very, you know, you, you, you end up putting blinkers on because you've got a very difficult technical task to do and you can't it's very hard often to especially within a phd project to keep that really wide vision of the overall meaning of your work and the developments you're making and the the entrepreneurial mindset i developed when i started going when i went into an accelerator kind of uh, program that enabled me to pivot rapidly from you know here's a problem Okay, what's a solution for that? Okay, this is a new solution. What what else could we use that solution for? And allowing that creativity to just really flow is what made me look back at my previous work sculpting the growth of neurons and say, actually, this could be really useful for solving a very important problem of actually connecting devices to the nervous system. And, and in a sense, it's, it's also being in that setting where you have that need and that mindset where you're looking for that need is where you it is what creates that initial drive. Secondly, I was also inspired to follow that idea because a, a friend of mine who'd been paralyzed some years before was given a terminal cancer diagnosis. And I thought, well, it doesn't matter how crazy this idea is, I have to you know, I'm sort of obliged to, to figure it out if it's possible or not until somebody can tell me otherwise or I prove it otherwise. So that gave me a drive. And in the commercial setting, I could see a much more rapid impact from those ideas. And then also a really key point here is that actually in my position as a certain sort of independent entity, I have a lot of freedom in engaging with multiple academic institutions, multiple uh, contract research organizations, multinational corporations in a very agile, low bureaucratic overhead. And my outgoings uh, are much lower than they would be if I was at a university in many senses. I have to pay sometimes for expensive access to research facilities. But you know, that helps me develop a wider network. And in the process, I often get a lot of pro bono support from leading academics and contract research organizations who are more than willing to help early stage technologies get off the ground. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Yeah, I, I agree. Like, I think business forces you to be a little bit more nimble and to pivot and, and to change a little bit faster than in academia. Like, that is kind of, you know, a disadvantage of academia is that, you know, People can be going down the wrong path for a decade, but they're not really incentivized to to change. So I think that that's pretty interesting that you recognize that. What's what's kind of the um, short term and long term plans or uh, aspirations of Neuraloom? Sure. Yeah. So in the short term, we're really concentrating on advancing the. You know, we're we're getting some early demonstration. Uh, of the advantages of our, our microstructured approach to, to producing living electrodes. But at the, the, the core development we want to do over the next few years is really refining this enabling technology in Neuraloom language, weaving neurons with electronics. And that's getting the, the, the integration of the additive manufacturing, the two-photon polymerization, the electrophysiology, the microelectrode arrays, and the living neurons which is influenced with the tissue engineering field, all integrated into a, into a fabrication suite and an optimized workflow for making a vast array of dish, different artificial neural tissues and demonstrating the potential that they can have in, in a few key commercially strategic identified products. And then beyond that, 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 that evidence serves as a sort of foundation for this platform technology that we will then seek to get investment to commercialize the most promising medical device prototypes that we've produced over that in the longer term then those those devices you know there's they they will take a lot of time to develop and they will come with their own challenges and there will be generations of those devices in each of those fields so you know when when we're looking at creating an implant that sort of rebalances the the functioning of the sort of memory consolidation and activation pathways in the 
in the temporal lobe that are responsible for really, you know organizing your your memories and and often degenerate in later years and in many well known memory disorders like dementia and Alzheimer's disease. They the, the the trials you have to do to to show that you can create a device that actually prevents the onset of of a memory disorder. So it has to last to you know ten. 10, 15 years, and then you're just at the point where you've got proof that you've got a a product that can be commercialized. And that's then a whole nother journey. And and just to implement that in the first developing market, in the developed markets has had many challenges. But it's my really long term goal to get those technologies to to be spread globally and, and into the less wealthy nations. And that comes with another huge stack of problems. So, you know, I see I see my long term goals, you know, as short terms is, is developing these tenet technology, long term is making sure that they get to everybody that needs them. Yeah, definitely. I think, uh, well, democratization of technology, once once it becomes a little bit more common, then, then more and more people will be able to have it and it'll be cheaper and cheaper to get. So you had mentioned that you have gotten other awards. I mean, do you want to talk about other awards, grants, or investment that you've gotten in the company since 2018? Yeah, so I think the one you referred to was from Panacea Stars, run by Panacea Innovation in in Oxford here in the UK. But other than that, I, I received a Displaying Futures Award from Merck, the Merck Group based in Darmstadt in, in Germany, the, I think the oldest pharmaceutical company in the world, celebrated their 350th birthday recently. And uh, that that provided me with uh, with some cash, but also some mentoring from their performance materials department who have been producing, you know, the materials which have sort of under been underlying the semiconductor revolution over the last 20 30 years that have driven the massive increase of computational power that have given us the sort of modern digital world and uh, you know their experience driving the development of enabling technologies that lead to you know many other commercial endeavors has been has been really useful and insightful and then you know then then beyond that had a lot of awards to to provide business support and training and leadership commercial analysis and and these kind of things which i see is is really important in making this transition from you know a dedicated full-time research scientist to a a balanced scientific entrepreneur who who is able to to sort of adapt and respond and and lead both the commercial aspects and the research aspects of the company. Yeah. Wow. Still pretty still pretty small, still pretty lean sounds like. Yeah. How many how big is your group? How many employees do you have? So yeah, we we're just at, at 3 at the moment. We've kept it very lean and at times we still still some of us go well not myself, but others are, are part time or or not paid at all. We try to, you know, really keep it lean as possible. There's a lot we can do ticking things along in terms of producing these designs, getting the basic and sort of fundamental science demonstrated without that big influx of investment. And it's it's really key that when we get that investment, we've really fully scoped out what the invention here we're dealing with and how much value truly is there and how we're going to spend that money because ultimately that's what we're asking it for and we want to spend that money when we get it in exactly the right way and on exactly the right projects so you know maybe making sure that that we do as much of that preparation leanly because you don't get many chances once you start raising those significant sums of cash yeah, for sure. So do the science with non-dilutative grants or, I don't know, prizes or something like this. And then once you really nail down the business model, then then go after VC investment money. You're not opposed to it then, right? No, no, not, not at all. It definitely has its place for sure. And it's also worth pointing out that at the, the very beginning, you need some private, a little bit of private capital, whether that could still come from a, from a, a prize, but you know, establishing your IP position very early on is really key for for this kind of company. And before you you want to really be doing that before you've spoken or engaged, you know, with any external organisations. Uh, and you can sometimes find yourself with a bit of a chicken or an egg sit- chicken and egg situation there because you know you no one's going to to give you any money until you've got an asset, and but you need money to protect your intellectual property asset. 
So I, you know, having a, that's why, you, you know, having a bit of your own, own finance or the friends and family aspect or small competitions comes in to, to get that very first starting point. But then after that, you know, there's more and more investment into the ecosystem, both privately and from, you know, regional and national governments to foster innovation and particularly more and more for, you know, long term deep tech innovation as well. It's it's certainly growing. And and there's a lot of very fantastic, helpful people who are willing to help you connect and providing provide you with the sort of skills and know how you need to do that. Yeah, for sure. Well, that's a hell of an endeavor, man. I think this is great, like kind of uh, trudging along doing the science on your own. Not a lot of people do that. And I think that's kind of, uh, you know, it's it's a big undertaking, but but I like it. And I think it's it's it seems to be progressing. So I'm really rooting for you. I think this is going to be really cool once it comes out. Is there anything that we didn't talk about that you wanted to mention? No, I mean, I guess I should just probably clarify that when you say they're doing the science on my own, I'd like to take that all the credit and I may have invented sort of be the sole inventor on, on the patent, but you know I get a lot of support from uh, the academic collaborators and the contract research organisations I work with. It's another way that I operate very leanly. I don't don't rent uh, a, a facility for the last didn't rent for the last two years, but I have had access to some of the you know lead, world leading uh, facilities at places like Cambridge University and and King's College London and in, Imperial College London that. You know, and I think that was really liberating coming out of academia and realizing that that there's ways to access these state of the art facilities. And there's one company that's a startup here in in the UK cluster market who have have sort of they describe themselves as the Airbnb for research equipment. And now all of these fantastic machines locked up in private and academic institutions all over the place are now much more accessible. And that that democratization of research. Is, is starting to happen. And that's really exciting. Yeah, that is pretty crazy. I mean, a lot of times in academia, you don't even realize how expensive some of these tools are. And so, for example, some microscope or some tool might be 60 or or $100 per hour. And, you know, you just kind of hop on it without even thinking. But for somebody in your position, it's like, ooh, wow, $100, do I want to spend it on this? Like, you really have to think twice about it. But but yeah, it is interesting. At least it's open. At least it's not like, oh, I, I would have to spend $15,000 to be able to purchase this equipment, something like that. Well, you know, I mean, that's unfortunately the position where we're at now as we're as we're costing for our you know, dedicated biohybrid fabrication facility. You know, the the two photon polymerization devices all all come in over. You know, they're from German manufacturers, so they're around five hundred thousand euros up there. The sort of seven hundred and fifty thousand US dollars, which is a pretty high price tag for just one of the one of the devices you need. So there's a big step up, a necessary step up to develop your own facility for these advanced technologies. But choosing the time that you do it is is critical. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Well, you know, one day I might be in your shoes too. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, no, well, I'm sure we'll, we'll have plenty to discuss over the years. I think so too. Well, Ben Paul, this has been excellent. Very much enjoyed this conversation. It's up my alley, so I, I think it's a little bit more near and dear to my heart. But uh, yeah, thank you for agreeing to come on the show. Great. It was uh, really nice speaking with Dan. Thank you so much for having me on. Wow, that was really interesting. I mean, that that really is up my alley. Before and after, we were also talking, and I guess he's starting another company, kind of a hand cream company against this you know, COVID virus. And uh, so I was kind of laughing, like this is you know very much different. But he's like, no, actually, it's it's very much similar. I mean, you're basically looking at nanoparticles and the the human biology interaction with that. And uh, he was kind of laughing that the regulation is so much easier for that kind of stuff. So it's kind of cool to have these different projects, lots of irons in the fire. And, you know, you kind of wait on some of these because a lot of times, a lot of business, a lot of research, a lot of everything is simply waiting. And, you know, you could be waiting sometimes for a few months for some result or something to come back to you. And you really can't do much. But that's, you know, the perfect time to switch over to something that's working. So you don't get completely frustrated. Because otherwise, if you're frustrated, then, you know, something's not going, then that's, that's really, well, frustrating. But, you know, if, if at least one project is going well, I think you'd be like, well, it's not me, it's the project itself, you know, and then eventually, you can get to a solution with that. If it is approved by the FDA and the regulatory 
framework, then I think this would be a very interesting way to interface with the body, have, have neural implants interface with the body because, you know, it's semi-natural. It's kind of a living implant and there's there's less of a chance of rejection. So it's very much futuristic in my opinion. And I think, I think this is what we're eventually going to be doing. So let's see. Hope you enjoyed the show and were able to learn something new, bringing together different fields in novel ways. Until next time on the Neural Implant Podcast.